Hello again. <laughs> um, I was on the Firefox uh, and it wasn't working, so I have to do it on Chrome. Sorry. So apparently everything should be OK now. Sound is on. Welcome, everybody. Um, I will repeat what I just said earlier. It was so lovely. This is my second um, broadcast uh, and um, live streaming and I'm a bit more relaxed today got the opening thing wrong sound should be okay now welcome all thank you audrey and uh sonic hey so many lovely people i feel you're all here with me we could be around a fire at a festival all sharing together and this is the world that we're in at the moment and it's so lovely i'm very touched so hi i am mutura das and um, this broadcast is coming from the southwest of London, and um, I'm going to do them regularly. I'm going to start off with the three ohms that you can join, uh, join in with me. And then I'm going to do some mantra, Shri Krishna Govinda Hari Murari, He Nata Narayana Vasudeva, which is going to change halfway through into Om Namo Narayana. And then due to the request of Pratik, uh, he wanted me to do O India, and after I've done that, I'm going to go off on a bit of a waffle and a talk and a story, and I know you all like stories. So thank you very much, please. It's an honor. It's lovely to share with you. <coughs> oh. Hi Sandipan, it's lovely to see people from Calcutta joining in. Sandipan is a lovely musician. I've been checking his music out recently. Hari Krishna. This is my own composition, Sri Krishna Govinda Hari Murari. And then it's going to change into Om Namo Narayanaya. And it's going to be kind of question and response. You can just sing at home along with me. Thank you. We have to imagine that there's a tabla here and some lovely shakers and it's going da -di 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 -da -da -di 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 -da da din din da 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 Thank you. 
So the story goes that Sri Ramanuja Acharya, one of the great Vaishnava Acharyas from the 11th century South India, apparently when he was given this mantra, Om Namo Narayana, his guru says, be careful because if you give this out, it can liberate anybody and you have to be careful. It was a bit touchy in those days to give up mantras to everybody. And the first thing he did apparently was go up to a very high pillar or a building and shout out the mantra to everybody. He completely um, went against his guru's instructions and shouted it out to everybody. So, Om Namo Narayana, that is the main mantra of Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, Hari Om. If you go to the main Vishnu temples in South India, um, Sri Rangam specifically, um, which is the headquarters, you could say, of the uh, Ramanuja Sampradaya. Sampradayas are lineages and uh, they go back to the beginning of time, but in a more, a more modern era, you could say, uh, certain acharyas, great teachers, have, uh, found, have become the main prominent, they have given schools of thought, interpretations to the Vedas, because every aspect of Sanatana Dharma, or what is popularly known as Hinduism, has its roots in some aspect of what an umbrella term that's used, a Vedic culture. And uh, there's so many branches and lineages and sub-branches and aspects to the whole of Hinduism. I'm not going to talk about that now, but that there are lineages and sampradayas and Ramanujacharya is the founder, the Acharya of um, well, he's actually, no, he's not the founder of Acharya. His guru was Jamuna Acharya, and there are many other Acharyas. But he was the most prominent. And the way that you really become a prominent Acharya, uh, because it means you have to be an authority. And to be an authority in India means you have to know the scriptures, the Shastras. And you have to understand them. You have to not only just be a spiritual adept but you have to have vast intellectual acumen and uh, be a vidwan a great ocean of knowledge and of the vedic texts the most highfalutin um, is the vedanta sutras which are short little aphorisms with condensed meanings and all the great acharyas in modern times shankaracharya from the 8th century he wrote his commentary on the Vedanta Sutras. They're called Bhasyas. And every Bhasya commentary has a, a Siddhanta. And a Siddhanta is a, a summing up. A, 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 it's a summing up of the whole of the philosophy. So. You may come to me and say, Himatura, what's your trip, man? And I, well, I might say, if I was Shankar, follower of Shankar, I'd go, it's all one. That's what's popular in a lot of people. Know. It's quite popular these days. It's called Advaita. There's all sorts of neo-Advaita schools. Absolute monism in the West, it would be called. Kevalya Advaita is the school of Shankar. And he appeared in the 8th century. And his commentaries on Vedanta and Vedic texts were so powerful and influential that actually they were one of the main reasons why 
Buddhism that was very prevalent had grown to be very large in India, it kind of started to spread more and leave India, a lot to do with the influence of Shankaracharya. And um, Ramanuja appeared in the 11th century and he countered the um, um, uh, interpretation of Vedanta and Vedic texts of Shankara. Um, and his Siddhanta conclusion was called Vashisht Advaita, which means qualified oneness. I will sing a song one day, uh, maybe tomorrow or later, about uh, this oneness and manyness. But what I'm going to do now is uh, get a little bit lighter uh, and sing a song that's um, Pratik, who is in Bombay, lovely friend of mine, beautiful man, um, who I met actually online, buying a, being a customer of three. I shouldn't actually say that, but we became friends online. He was at a call center and we've been friends since then. And Darren as well. And he's wonderful. And so his family. And he has requested that I sing O oh India. O oh India is a, if anybody didn't wasn't watching yesterday. Um, I have a, a musical partnership uh, in, in a group called the Bindu Babas with my dearly beloved friend Pranaji, who is not here, unfortunately. And we wrote many songs. We performed in England through the festival, uh, in the festival circuit, the Green Gathering, Buddha Field, and other gatherings of, of such type. And um, we, while we were in India, um, we together we wrote this song. Um, I came up with a rift. I was very into Latin music. I'd seen Buena Vista Social Club and I was experimenting with Latin chords and changes. And I had a riff and Prana said, what are you doing with that? And I said, I don't know. And he said, keep playing it. And I kept playing this rift and he came up with the first line, which is gather round and hear my story. So that's how we started writing this song and we performed it first live in the Kana Nirvana Cafe in Dharmshala. And I have to say, um, up until then, I was extremely nervous about gigging. Uh, you wouldn't think it, you'd think, my God, Matura nervous? No, but I was very, very nervous, shy. Prana was born to perform. He'd been performing his whole life, writing songs, busking all over the place. But it was new for me. And we performed this song with some other songs. And we got such an amazing response uh, and the crowd went wild that um, I stopped my whole freak out and nervousness about um, performing. And uh, one girl who was there came up to me and said it was the first time hearing our gig and our song that she had spilled, uh, she'd been very depressed and it gave her happiness. And I was, it was a quite an amazing reaction to get from just the song that you sit and find interesting. Now, this song, India is a big subject, isn't it? It's massive. And many people watching today are either from India, have been to India, influenced by Indian ideas, the food, the culture. In one way, a lot of people are in love with India. And in 1996, um, my life started to get unusual. Um, there was all sorts of energies I detected in my universe, in my world that were beginning to rise. And um, I had a bit of a, a Kundalini thing. Many people have Kundalini things. Nikki Slade describes her Kundalini story in her very interesting book. Nikki Slade is a, a very well-known Kirtan singer from England. She teaches Kirtan and she's got a great book. And um, Stanislav Groff, the great psychologist, his wife, Christina, uh, had um, uncontrollable Kundalini experiences. So that's another uh, subject. But what happened was I met this very, very interesting person, um, um, a Baba, not a, a, a celibate renunciate, but a married man. Edu used to be a chemistry professor from Bihar. And I met him in Varanasi. And um, I had extraordinary experiences uh, from him um, through a system that's quite well known, uh, talked about in different spiritual circles in India called Shaktipad. Shakti means energy, Pad means kind of transference and different teachers and gurus who are connected with this kind of system, they, there's a form of transmission of Shakti 
that comes in different ways. Some great teachers like Ananda Moy Ma, people would just walk, it'd be in her presence and she would just exude spiritual energy and people would go into experience all sorts of things. Um, this uh, experience that I had was um, a touching of my thumbs by Ranjit Nath. It's a long detailed story. I might go into it after I've sung this song. Um, and it's about um, meeting him, but before that also being in Bengal and meeting a Sikh who told about all sorts of things as an astrologer. And um, please feel free to join in the chorus, okay? For those of you who know it, um, it's called O oh India, written by me and Prana, and I hope you enjoy it, okay? I do these funny noises with my mouth. Some people call it the rubber trumpet because I don't have any instrumentalist or saxophone player here. Prana does it much better than me. He can do trumpets, saxophones, and trombones uh, 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 all with his mouth. And I just sound a bit like a headless chicken. But anyway, here we go. Gather round and hear my story Tales intriguing from afar How I lost my heart completely In the land called India On a sweet breeze I went sailing To this land of ancient kings Spun the wheel to seek my fortune For who knows what tomorrow brings and rickshaws everywhere and bright-eyed girls with flowers in their hair sitting on the corner sitting on the corner with your parties and rice pay the dahi walla for a lassie and ice porter took my bags to the hotel room baba said he'd see me in the afternoon when Baba came to see me through his pan-stained teeth, he said, It's your lucky day. We got some Mazari Shari. Oh, India, you'll always be my love affair. There's never been a jewel so rare. There's no one like you anywhere. Oh, India, yes, you're the only one for me. I'm as high as I could ever be, and only 50 quid a key. In the wilds of West Bengal, I met a psychic seat called Sing With just one look and in an instant He could tell me everything Something big was gonna happen After I turned 43 Unifying mystic forces Would reveal my destiny Took a nasty sleeper down to Baronsi Smoked a wicked chill and drinking spicy chai tea Sitting by the Ganges after taking my bath And when I looked around there was this Ranjit man A barber dressed in black and all covered in ash Hypnotic eyes and garland did the shivery clutch I was taken by surprise, I didn't know what to do He said, welcome my friend, I've been expecting you Oh, in You'll always be my love affair There's never been a jewel so rare I think we'd make a lovely pair Oh, India Yes, you're the only one for me Tied on my mouth and did this banyan tree As happy as can be Went back to this fellow's duty Where we sat for 
for quite a while Revealed his deepest secrets to me Passed down through the hands of time He seemed to touch something inside me A wave of light engulfed my soul I took a transcendental journey The greatest story yet untold Kundalini rising like my spine was on fire Sucked into a vortex passing through my third eye Chakra started spinning, they all started to ring And then I watched the heavens open and I saw everything Past, present and future all rolled into one Endless lives and visions all that I've ever done God handed me the script and as I turned the first page I was looking at the dawning of a new golden age Oh India, you'll always be my love affair There's never been a jewel so rare There's no one like you anywhere Oh India, yes you're the only one for me I wonder what my next door neighbours would say If I took you out to mum for tea <laughs> Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Hope you enjoyed that. So yes, that's uh, one of the um, strange things that can happen to anybody in India, but uh, it does happen a, a lot to a few foreigners. I know they've had all sorts of strange experiences and that's what's happened to me. And um, okay, I've been, uh, this has been going for about half an hour now. I'm going to talk for a little bit because that's what I plan to do uh, with these presentations. I like talking, as you gathered. And apparently people like hearing what I have to say. Um, I, everyone likes a story, don't they, really? Um, so in 2005, my mother passed away and I s took up residence in a lovely, beautiful place in Masuri. Uh, which is in the Himalayas, not far from Rishikesh. It's an old British Raj Hill station. And I had the good fortune to stay with a very interesting gentleman, Sudhir Papliao. And uh, had there was Rattan in the house and Satish, who was a family living in this big old British uh, uh, bungalow, Raj, built in 1840, in 20 acres of forest. Uh, south of the Mall in Missouri, which is the top part of the ridge at 6,000 feet and overlooking Dehradun, which is now the capital of the new state of Uttaranchal that was created a few years ago, which goes from Haridwar up to the Himalayas. So while I was sitting there, I had, um, I, it was a big thing. Um, I turned 50, my mother had passed away and I'd been traveling in India since 76 and I needed to sit somewhere and reflect on life, a big chapter in my life had uh, finished. And then I started to think about how, how, why am I like I am? Why, how did I get my name? And as I mentioned yesterday, um, this kind of talk is based upon a simple, uh, the, the simple essence of my talk is what is in a name? How did I, get the name Mathuradas. Uh, there's a lot of foreigners with Indian names. There's a um, kind of an issue amongst certain people about a culture, cultural uh, misappropriation or f people taking other people's cu uh, uh, cultures and trivializing them. But um, that is, there is, there can be an issue with that. But um, this is the story about people like myself who, I'm 63 now, and uh, some amazing things happened to me in my teens, late teens. And um, they were so powerful and influential that I decided not to go to art college, um, do a foundation course in England, and actually to leave everything and go off and join an ashram. 
And even in, in India, I think most kind of parents would be a bit horrified if their 16 year old son decided to say, no, mom, I don't want to study. No, dad, I just want to go off and live in an ashram. They would be freaked out. Uh, but uh, my lovely parents, my mother, uh, even though it was a big shock for them because my mum was an agnostic and my father a uh, kind of um, uh, of Jewish stock, but a complete atheist, uh, we didn't have any mention of God in our house. Um, it, this shocks quite a few people because a lot of people in the world, they are born with religion and uh, religion is, um, they can't imagine that somebody can not have a religion. But um, I'm just going to move myself that light. Hold on a second. <coughs> Okay, excuse me, and that light was shining, it's still shining in my eyes, but, um, okay. <laughs> um, sorry about the reflection in my glass, there's nothing I can do about it at the moment. Um, so I had a lot of time to think about life and think about the, and I'm very interested in historical pro, uh, processes, and um, nothing just comes from nowhere, really. You know, OK, so I'm traveling on, say, if I'm traveling on a train in India and I'm not dressed specifically in a kurta, I've got a mustache, I don't have a tilak marking uh, on my forehead. I'm not overtly a Krishna devotee. And so I'm traveling on a train and somebody will say, excuse me, what is your good name, please? And I will go, Maturadas. And they often go, what? What? How did you get this name? Because apparently there was a war, a film made in India a few years ago about the battle between India and Pakistan. And one of the heroes is called Maturadas. So in India, a lot that, he's the most kind of famous Maturadas that's been in India. But funnily enough, my um, landlord, Sudhir, and his friends were all sitting around with their whiskey one evening, having a laugh about all the different Maturadases. And they were all going, oh, do you remember Maturadas up there at the Panwala? Yeah, he was a nice guy in that Maturadas. So it's quite a common name in India. Yeah. Uh, and, but me, I'm from a middle class family, southwest London, born in 1956, and I got this name in 1974. Now, it's not on my passport, uh, but it's the name that most people know me by, and I've identified with this name of mine, even though I was born Mark and I have a middle name called William, which is what they call me at work. But actually, I am Maturadas. So I want to tell you a story. Um, because I've been thinking about this a lot and it's kind of eventually what I would like to do is talk, travel and talk and do what I'm kind of doing in these presentations is uh, talking about things um, and giving a song some chance and explaining uh, this interest of mine because it's a phenomena that affects millions and millions of people on the world and a lot of people don't really understand the background behind things. Um, um, I always, because I focus on this subject and it's kind of my um, thing, really, I, I, it's my expertise in this, in this field, uh, I, I kind of, you, one can often assume that everybody else has, uh, knows what one does know. So um, I'm not going to assume, as I'm speaking to a very large audience, many of the things that I might talk might be go, people going, oh yeah, yeah, I know all that, you know kind of move on but I'm going to uh, not spend too much time on everything but I'll give a kind of um I'll try and put a big big story into a short as amount of time as possible and I'm not going to explain everything today I'm going to talk for as long as I can talk and then I'm just going to continue the talk another day because there's a lot to tell okay and um, now when I've asked those people on the train in India have asked me and I've told them Maturidas. The second thing they ask is they look at me and they go, hmm, are you are, and I explain, I said, I can give a very simple explanation. My guru gave me this name. That's the uh, one sentence answer to where I got the name Maturidas. They'll go, ah, and then they'll look at me and they'll go, and now are you still part of this Hare Krishna organization or movement? And I will go, no, actually, I'm freelance, I'm independent. And they'll go, oh, why? So that's the second part of my story uh, that I wrote. My first part of my story is how did I get the name Maturidas and what actually happened when I got that name? And the question is my journey with the Krishna institution, not the movement, but the institution came to an end in 19. 
80. From 1973 to 1980, I was a full-time member of the Hare Krishna movement, but I've been kind of freelance since then. So people might want to know. So that's a long way down the line, that story. I'm going to give you now um, an introduction to a story which is um, explains not just me, how I got the name Maturadas and uh, Krishna orientated. It's actually a, a story of a subgroup of the baby boom generation, basically. Uh, that, that's the, the end, you could say, the story that I'm directly involved with. And um, that story is a story of um, the subgroup is a group of people that in the 60s uh, went on a journey and the two um, uh, kind of like major influence, one of the major influences, or I could say the major influence that um, uh, had uh, on, on this subgroup to get involved with Indian, specifically spirituality, was the role of psychedelics in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, this had a huge um, influence on millions of people and not everybody reacted in the same way, um, but um, quite a lot of people did. And I'm going to explain that story about, uh, that includes that subgroup and how many, many people, because not only Hare Krishna gurus give Indian names to their disciples, there's so many gurus that have come from India and have students and people have changed their names and that's part of this story okay so here we go okay now the bigger picture that in, in terms of how I became a Turidas, there are two stories that coalesced in my life and co you could say co collided and created who I am one is the psychedelic um, story and I call the, call it the ripple effect okay because uh, psychedelic, you know, uh, uh, paradigm shifts and movements and ideas can start with literally one person or a group of people and spread out like ripples and have influences immediately and they can be influenced over thousands of years. You know, look at Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and, and, and this is, the, the, so the psychedelic story in the modern day uh, uh, story is more of a contemporary story. But the, uh, the, the Krishna story starts once upon a time, long, long ago, okay? Now, that is part of the story that comes down from thousands of years uh, in India and reaches us in the modern period, you could say during the time of the British, in the mid 18th century. And then gradually it comes down uh, in terms of, uh, it comes down to the 20th century and then it comes to the West. And that's where my involvement in the story becomes. But one has to backtrack a little bit just so that one understands a little bit about the world. Because uh, many people in India also may not be understanding actually how this all kind of East-West connection with the spirituality came, came about. So if you look at, if you can imagine the geography of the, um, of the planet, uh, England is just this small little country over there in the North Sea, and there's this massive Europe and Russia, and then there's South America and North America and Africa, and then over in the East, we get through to the Middle East, and then we get India, and in, uh, uh, before 1947, India included Pakistan and Bangladesh, and before that, it actually included Afghanistan and Burma, and it includes all the other eastern states. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the culture that came from India spread as far as Cambodia, Indonesia, and it was a very important culture. So, but if one would go back to, say, um, Elizabethan England, or pre-Elizabethan England, not many people in Europe really knew about India. Not many people had traveled. Nobody really understood about it. Um, and the power uh, that when one looks at world history, one generally focuses on the European influence on world history, not to neglect what was going on in the world, but I'm going to focus on that aspect of the story because that involves India specifically. And the identity Okay, because so we're talking about people that are in England that are getting get, get influenced by this 
whatever's coming from this world over there, this mysterious world that we, is from India, what, what, what's going on here? So um, gradually in, 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 in Europe, people in England started to become more and more aware of um, other cultures. And these cultures started to seep into England. We'd already had the Romans uh, and with, the, with their culture. They left, they left remnants of it. Then we had the Angles and the Saxons. And then we had in 1066, we had the French. So we look at English language, there's lots of French and there's all of these different things and all these stuff, different influences coming in. And then around, I think 17th century, may have been earlier, um, rich young um, men from Europe, especially England, they used to go on what is called a tour of Greece and the ancient world. And this way, they got very um, um, influenced by the styles and the culture of a culture that was not British. But, uh, you know, the British, the religion of Christianity, it started in the Middle East uh, and it got translated and the whole kind of culture of that was uh, uh, in Latin. And the center of that was in, in Rome, in Italy as well. So a few people in Europe, they got influenced by that. And then gradually, as um, Europe started to expand and their boats and their naval fleets got more and more um, uh proficient in traversing the waves and going tra co uh, covering all these long distances from Europe to India. Um, the Spanish and the Portuguese were kind of first on it. They were kind of the big guns in Europe at that time. They arrived in, 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 uh, in different parts of India, got settled in Goa. And at that time, India was being um, run by the Mughals and they, with their center in Delhi and in Agra. So the Mughal emperor was based there and um, the um, they had all sorts of different deals, the Europeans with the uh, with the Indians about what they were doing there. And it was all about business and trade, really. Amongst all of that, there were intellectuals and people. And of course, they were trying to explain uh, that, you know, the Catholic religion to the Mughals and the culture. Uh, um, and, and certain things were shared, you know, and some of the intellectuals got interested in some of the ideas behind uh, um, what that were coming from India, but it was a minority. Okay, the next big step really was when uh, uh, there was the Dutch and the French, you know, they were all there, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and all different parts of India, and all getting involved in India in various ways. And England, its own story and how it's influenced the world and the British Empire, started to get um, established more and more and more in India, basically. And then around the 18th century, uh, and Calcutta, uh, specifically, it's very important this, Calcutta was a, tra a trading port that had been very, very small before, more than, say, Bombay and Madras, that were trading centres. Uh, Calcutta was a trading centre, but they, it became the capital uh, 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 of of this uh, well, first of all, it was the East India Company it, before actually the royal the the, the uh, um, throne. Uh, um, Queen, uh, Queen Victoria was, I think, pronounced Empress of India in eighteen sixty. Took a while for that, but the influence of the British was very very big, and Calcutta became one of the second biggest. Um, uh, cities in the in the in the British Empire at that time. Now, during this period in India, there was a um, a class of Indians. Basically, you could they were called in Bengal they were called Badrolok. They were like the kind of middle upper middle classes of India, and um, to survive, you could say, in this new culture that was. Uh, uh, um, being set up by the British in Calcutta, many of the British actually set up in, uh, educational institutions in Calcutta to educate a class. They wanted a class of Indians that could run India for them because there was just a handful of these Brits controlling millions of Indians. It's a mirror. It's amazing. People often wonder how this was possible. And it is quite a strange phenomenon how they managed to do that. But one of the ways that they planned to do that was to um, um, build these institutions, uh, these educational institutions. And um, 
in those institutions, uh, classes of Bengalis went from their villages, or they were already in Calcutta, and they started to become aware and educated in the British language, English language, really. And they got, to, they became aware of Socrates and Plato, the Bible, Shakespeare, Milton, all these great thinkers from the West, they became aware. They, their whole vision and perspective on uh, the world um, enlarged. They had a, a, a much larger, um, an international perspective on the nature of life, really. And um, uh, the story that I'm connected to is a, a very much influenced by one specific person who was called Kedaranath Dutt. Okay. Now, Kedaranath Dutt, he uh, came to Calcutta in about, he was born about 1835 and then came in his 20s to Calcutta in about 1850 and became educated. And at that time, um, he befriended some very famous people that you may be aware of. Uh, you may have heard of Rabindranath Tagore, a great poet. Um, his br elder brother, um, they were also very well educated in the British system. Now, this class of um, Bengalis, um, they were um, very, very... Um, the British at that time were trying to well, their mode of operation was to actually kind of preach or explain to the Bengalis and the Indians that they were inferior, their culture was inferior, that the superior religion of Christianity and of the Greek culture, the ancient Greek culture, this is, it was all orientated around that. But before Bhaktivinoda Thakur actually moved there in around uh, the end of the 18th century, there was uh, um, um, the Oriental Institute in Calcutta was set up and some of the greatest minds uh, uh, in England uh, became part of that. One of the most famous is Sir William Jones. And uh, another uh, person who was part of that was Sir Charles Wilkins. Now, the interesting thing about Sir Charles Wilkins is that he's from the place where I'm staying now, Froome in Somerset. And in 1785, he completed the first English translation of Bhagavad Gita. And Bhagavad Gita is one of, it's, it's considered like the Hindu Bible. It's a section of a great Itihasya, great history called the Mahabharata, which is a great story from India. Now, these chaps, up until then, I think a, a few Portuguese may have been studied. You actually, to enter into um, this literature, this knowledge, this information about what is behind this culture what are all these temples what are all these gods what are all these different people doing india uh, is so diverse and uh, sanatan dharma the the, the 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 types of spiritual practices uh, were in um, uh, in um, in unfathomable to understand for the average western mind so it wasn't until these intellectuals um, um, like William Jones, he even became a vegetarian. He started to wear a dhoti. He lived in a, 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 he had to gain the trust of some local people, some Brahmins. Um, he was already uh, uh, one of the top Greek um, uh, scholars. I, th I think he was apparently fluent in many, many languages. He was a genius. And he cracked Sanskrit, you see. He learned Sanskrit. And so when these chaps, they entered into the, they discovered this whole world. They realize, my goodness, this culture is incredible. It surpasses even uh, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey in terms of its breadth and depth. And then there's, apart from the stories, there are these incredible philosophical texts, the Upanishads and Vedanta. Now, this was happening during this period, the turn of the 18th century to the 19th century. Gradually, this knowledge started to seep into the West, gradually started to seep. You know, the English became s sat in India. You know, there were many, many, uh, 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 at the beginning, many, many uh, British people got deeply involved with the culture. And then it went through a period. And then in the 19th century, there was a kind of, they started to get much more racist and much more uh, derogatory of the Indian culture. And it was following the moods, things that happened in India often following the moods of where everything was happening in, in, in Europe. And um, 
funny uh, funnily enough an offshoot of the kind of the slave anti-slave trade was a kind of christian missionary spirit where they all got on a big high horse moral high horse where they thought actually it's our moral duty and our right to go all over the world and 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 educate these dark-skinned barbarians with their primitive thoughts and their strange ideas and we're going to spread christianity but already in europe and around there were lots of intellectual people in the age of enlightenment and people were very dissatisfied with mainstream christianity and the dogma and their eyes were opening to all sorts of different ideas it's an incredible time and uh, not that i'm a great i've studied all the great western philosophers uh, or east all the eastern but i'm just giving you a kind of simple in, uh, um, introduction people like schopenhauer around 1811 were already quoting influences from the from the vedas you know uh, Hermann Hesse, the great writer, his uh, grandfather was in India. Um, he was translating books. Uh, uh, he was one of the early tra uh, uh, translators of the Karela, uh, Malayalam, the language down there. And there were people getting more and more involved and affectionate uh, with, 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 with the culture that was going on. And this developed, basically, uh, through the 19th century. And then you even got to the point where many of you may have heard the um of a famous book one of the first books i think written in english about chakras kundalini tantra these are words that are kind of quite common now and people uh, you know are quite aware especially if you're involved with yoga and spirituality uh but uh, and karma all these words which are kind of like used by everybody they started to kind of like come in around this period into a few people's ideas and there's a few things that happen sociologically that kind of allowed this to happen so so john woodruff whose pen name was arthur avalon he was one of these british people that actually had affection for indian culture he used to hold soirees at his house of indian music he was friendly with indian artists and he was uh, had a lot of affinity for the Indian culture. Now, so there's a big jump from intellectuals and ling uh, uh, linguists who are studying texts because they are fascinated in just the language uh, or, or the stories, but uh, never in their wildest dreams, I don't think any of those would have thought that they would convert or even practice these um, the teachings that are coming from these countries. But by the end of the 19th century, there were a few people, Westerners, who were not more, not just interested in the stories or the language of Sanskrit, they were actually interested in the spirituality. And this wasn't easy because uh, uh, um, especially uh, uh, in, in India, they're the caste of Brahmins, who are the caste of the generally very learned and hereditary well read in these ancient texts they had all sorts of caste issues about even associating with foreigners you know what to speak of actually um, sharing the esoteric knowledge so that's what sir john woodruff did he because of his love of indian culture he developed the trust of a brahmin and they sat together and they compiled together um, serpent power one of the very first books um, i've only looked at it it's very very technical it's very and you can see a picture of sir john woodruff in about 1880 1890 standing in front of the sun temple conorak in orissa and he's dressed in a, a dhoti basically so this is an english uh, you know magistrate uh, uh, you know starting to practice certain kind of tantric practices so this is kind of um, this is the kind of you could say the beginning of kind of what's going to lead up to people like me uh, who are going to kind of adopt this uh, kind of religion and some of the teachings from there in a very very deep way now um, I'm going to just talk about one person more before I go on and finish this talk for today because I'm going to carry on tomorrow um, one of the people and it was interesting because not everybody knows this and I, I i kind of assume that people uh, uh know all the stuff that um, i'm interested in but um there was a lady uh, who was from russia and she her she was known as madame blavatsky and she created a kind of a movement called theosophy the, the theosophical society and um uh, she had uh, she came to india 
And she wrote two very big famous books, um, Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine. Now, I've been living in Glastonbury, uh, which is in, uh, not far from here in Froome. And if you go to Glastonbury now, uh, in, in 2020, you will find traces of practically everything that she was interested in scattered in various forms uh, um, in that town. And before that time, um, nobody had really kind of uh, uh, joined dots together. Now, whether this joining of dots that Madame Blavatsky created was accurate and a true portrayal of the nature of things is another question. The question is, she did it and she created this thing. And as I was saying earlier, Christianity, mainstream Christianity, amongst intellectuals and certain people, had, had was, people were, it wasn't satisfying for them. So um, even undercover during kind of fanatical Christian regimes and the Inquisition, many practitioners of Kabbalah and similar types of things kept it very secret. And also even in England, folk traditions and people that were into paganism, they kept it all very quiet during the kind of big kind of blanket Christianity and all sorts of teachings and beliefs were kind of under under the under the radar so to speak you know uh, because basically people um, it's very frightening to live in a society as we can see today uh, people are very very prejudiced and, uh, and about uh, groups you know, oh they think this he thinks this he's not one of us he's one of them or they are part of that and, and, and if we look at history it's full of groups of people who are minorities getting persecuted. So a lot of people kept their ideas quite quiet. Uh, so you've got uh, practices like Kabbalah, which is coming, which has, has its Jewish roots. You've got Rosicrucianism. You've got various forms of paganism and Druidism. And then you've got esoteric Freemasonry. And all these things were appearing in the 18th century, basically, and becoming more and more popular amongst intellectuals. And this kind of grew into the 18th century and what people called the spiritist movement. It was a very, very, very uh, a, a big movement, especially amongst higher class uh, Europeans. And into such scenarios came famous people that had a big influence on, uh, on Russia and communism, people like Rasputin. They were all influenced by these things. Now, Madame Blavatsky, what she did was she joined the dots, not only between these uh, the Western mystery schools, but to Hinduism, Buddhism, and, and shamanism, and joining all this together, you see. So <coughs> the influence of literatures like Madame Blavatsky can't be underestimated. And it had a huge influence so that at the turn of the century, it came to the point where there was enough interest in the West for people to hear the actual spiritual messages that were coming from India. And I'm going to start my talk tomorrow and carry on from that point and also then explain about the, um, I'm going to elaborate more on the spiritual Hare Krishna ripple effect, which gets involved with this and the psychedelic ripple effect, which starts with an experiment uh, with a, very, very uh, interesting scientist called Albert Hoffman in Sandos Laboratories in Switzerland, where he kind of accidentally discovered LSD. That's going to be in coming up in my talk tomorrow, or if not tomorrow, in a couple of days. I'll let you all know. Now I'm going to final finalize my uh, um, talk with a song and. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do a chant. I'm just going to do a song because time's going now. And I'm going to sing a, a, another song that Prana and me wrote. And it's all about, I've been talking about the past uh, a, a lot, but really um, we're all actually right here now. And um, I wanted, one of the reasons for these talks and sharings that we're all doing is to take us out of all of this fear and focus on this kind of like kind of quite upsetting scenario we're all finding ourselves in um, so i want to sing a song about now the moment now i'm an art i've got artistic nature and i know from my own personal experience that whenever i'm involved with a creative project it could be cooking could be writing art music my hands are involved somehow or other in the creative process i go into the moment naturally 
and it's a fun, wonderful state to be in. Um, two famous books that have used this uh, kind of uh, kind of idea have appeared in, in in you know in the 70s. A wonderful book was written by Ram Dass called "Be Here Now." He just passed away, bless his soul. Sold millions uh, or a couple of million, and it influenced a lot of people, including myself. Be here now. And I recommend you to read it. It's a great stepping stone. And more recently, we have more popular books like uh, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. So this song is um, kind of influenced. Um, Pranaji was right, reading uh, The Power of Now and I was kind of came up with a composition. He came back from Germany after visiting his lovely friend Sissy and we sat down. It was the quickest song I've ever read. Uh, 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 composed and uh, this is it it's called the only way to be drag having to tune but bear with me inside of mine As out of a dream my life unfolds before me Sure to reveal what's been there all the while Struggled so long to untie these ropes that bind me in a body of pain I remain frozen in time the future and the past are not within our grasp somewhere between the two you find the real you and what you'll find is love 
that frees you from all pain and with your inner light your sight you will regain there's nothing to compare to the joy of being there this moment holds the key we are eternity Thank you again. It has been wonderful to share these songs and chants and to let me talk about the things I'm interested in. And I will look forward to sharing some more with you. And um, please, if you think this is interesting and you want to share it with other friends, please share the link. Many people will be watching other um, and people who are performing now. My beautiful friend Madhava has been is doing a, a cast now, Madhava Norton, if you go on Facebook. Uh, Darren will be doing his piece, uh, Meditation, shortly. And uh, uh, I will put a message up when I'm going to uh, do my next talk. It might be tomorrow, and it might be the next day after. But thank you very much. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om. Om Shanti. And peace to all, because... Uh, that's what we need at the moment in this world. A lot of people are in anxiety and fear, and we don't need that in our lives, really. So try and escape now and then into some um, way of getting into your own power, uh, dip, dipping into your spiritual nature, and just become equipoised and calm, and don't let this shit and all the stuff going on bring you down. Adios.